we're going to jump right in with primary total hip arthroplasty. Now the surgical approaches to total hip arthroplasty are very testable topics and it's important that you have a good solid understanding of the muscular intervals, the nervous intervals, the pros and the cons of all four of these approaches. Now we'll review each one of these in detail, but I have this slide here for you as a summary. The anterior approach is the only approach that has a true internervous interval. The intramuscular interval is between the tensor and the sartorius as is depicted here. And of course the direct anterior approach goes by a number of different names including uh, those that I have listed. Now the path of the anterior approach uh, superficially uh, passes uh, between the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata and deep in between the rectus and the gluteus medius as is depicted in this slide. Now question writers love to test complications and uh, this is particularly important when it comes to the surgical approaches. Uh, you want to understand that the lateral femur cutaneous nerve is the most common complication, the most common nerve injury with the anterior approach uh, to total hip arthroplasty and this can result in thigh numbness. The ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex artery is also uh, in play and this can lead to significant bleeding if not to cauterize during the exposure. The exposure of the femur can be very challenging uh, and this is why it's often the uh, uh, potential to result in uh, various position of the stem or undersized uh, stem. So femoral exposure can be very challenging. Uh, I've again summarized the direct anterior approach on this slide with the muscular intervals and the internervous plane between the femoral, ar uh, uh, femoral nerve and the superior gluteal nerve and the pros and cons are listed. Certainly stability is a pro of the direct anterior approach as it is with all anterior approaches as well as rapid muscle recovery. The downside of course again is the challenging femoral exposure and uh, the uh, possibility of needing a special table. The uh, lateral approach or the direct uh, uh, lateral or modified Harding approach uh, as depicted here. This involves splitting the gluteus medius uh, between the anterior one-third and the posterior one-third. Now superior exposure can be difficult. Uh, superior extension past five centimeters outside of the so-called safe area puts the superior gluteal artery and nerve at risk uh, as is depicted in this slide. The uh, lateral approach, the muscular interval, is between the, uh, or uh, involves vastus uh, lateralis splitting as well as gluteus medius splitting. There is no true internervous plane. The benefit again, uh, the pro is stability. The downside is prolonged abductor recovery. Again, proximal extension can be challenging. The anterolateral approach, or the so-called Watson-Jones approach, is depicted in this slide. Uh, this approach involves going anterior to the gluteus medius. Uh, there is no internervous interval. The pro again is stability as with all anterior approaches. The downside, femoral exposure can be challenging. Uh, the tensor fascia lata can be de uh, denervated. Uh, and the uh, gluteus medius can also be uh, injured if not done carefully. The poster approach, which remains the most common approach to total hip arthroplasty, uh, which is probably most familiar to the audience. Uh, the uh, aspects of this approach are listed on this slide. It involves a maximus split and uh, external rotator tenotomies from the back of the femur. There is no internervous interval. The advantage to this approach, of course, is that uh, there is, it's quite extensile, both proximally and distally, uh, and recovery can be quite quick. The downside to the posterior approach, uh, historically, is instability. Now, that may be changing with larger femoral heads, uh, but again, for the purposes of the test, I think uh, posterior uh, approach should be associated with uh, instability. Let's move on to total hip arthroplasty fixation. Now, whether you cement or you use a cementless technique is controversial. Uh, certainly in North America, cementless fixation remains the mainstay uh, with total hip arthroplasty. I think a lot of us have concerns about the long-term results of cement, particularly in our younger patients. If you look at the results of the Charnley cemented arthroplasties, the data clearly suggests that cemented cups tend to fail at a higher rate than cemented stems, uh, and that has been a popular test question. And there's, of course, no potential to remodel with uh, cement. Now, on the femoral side, I think cementless or a well-done cemented femoral stem is acceptable. On the acetabular side, cementless fixation, I think, is uh, certainly preferred uh, in the North American uh, market. And this involves using a hemispherical cup with, uh, uh, with or without screws. Now, bone ingrowth or bone on growth is critical to the success of a cementless uh, technique. Bone grows into the porous structure of the metal. Uh, there are multiple options for how to achieve bone ingrowth, whether you use beads, mesh, fiber metal, etc. Uh, these are often atta attached to the cup itself using high temperatures. Now, there are three main requirements for bone ingrowth, and I've listed those here. Number one, and this is somewhat obvious, uh, live host bone is required. So if you're given a question that involves a patient who's had a radiation, I would not check the box that uses cementless fixation. 
With some of the newer, highly porous metals, that may be changing. But for the purposes of the test, if you have a radiation, I would pick a cemented uh, option. Number two is you need an appropriate material. You need appropriate porosity. If you have too much uh, porosity, the surface can actually shear off of the cup. Uh, too little and the bone won't grow in. I've listed the necessary pore depth as well as the gap. Uh, the pore depth needs to be between 50 and 150 microns to uh, adequately achieve ingrowth and a gap of less than 50 microns is required. Number three is no motion. If there's any motion in between the implant and the host bone, then fibrous ingrowth can occur. Uh, greater than 150 microns is where uh, we start to get into trouble. Let's talk a little bit about uh, cementless stem design. Titanium is the most common material used in cementless uh, stems. Uh, this is uh, more flexible, uh, similar to the elasticity of bone. This can result in less uh, sh uh, stress shielding and thigh pain, which is what we uh, would occasionally see with uh, stiffer cobalt chrome implants. Circumferential coating is important. It reduces the effect of joint space, reduces the uh, potential for osteolysis. Both ingrowth or ongrowth surface finishes have been uh, successful and proximal or distal fixation uh, can work. Stress shielding is an important concept to understand. This involves when a stem is distally fixed. Uh, we often see this in cylindrical, fully porous coated stems. Uh, larger stems tend to be stiffer uh, and this can result in more stress shielding. Cobalt chromium is the typical uh, culprit when we talk about stress shielding femoral implants. Uh, and I've listed some of the uh, factors that go into determining the stiffness of the stem. You should be familiar with an x-ray appearance of a stress shielded stem. We typically will see distal sclerosis and spot welds where the stem is well ingrown. This is the point of stress transfer between the stem and the host bone. Proximally, the bone is unloaded and we see osteopenia in this area. Remember this image as we talk about osteolysis uh, later, the appearance is different than osteolysis. Hydroxyapatite is an important surface coating to be familiar with. I've listed the chemical structure here, which has been tested in the past. Remember that hydroxyapatite is osteoconductive. It is not osteoinductive. Uh, and I've listed uh, some other characteristics here to be familiar with when it comes to hydroxyapatite. It is important to remember that this is a surface coating. It can, it can delaminate off the stem if ingrowth does not occur through the hydroxyapatite and into the stem uh, underneath as well. Modular neck femoral stems have lost uh, their popularity recently, but uh, were in uh, fairly widespread use a number of years ago. I think it's, familiar, uh, it's important to be familiar with this uh, implant. They were designed to increase the ability to restore biomechanics and his hip stability through these interchangeable modular necks. The problem with these implants uh, included corrosion at the modular interface as well as fractures of the neck and stem. Several of these implants have now been uh, recalled. Moving on to the cemented femur and uh, implant design. Uh, when it comes to cemented implant, uh, implants, flexible materials have not performed as well. Uh, titanium, for example, uh, tends to be flexible and it, uh, it leads to bending stress on the cement mantle. This can uh, result in uh, cracking of the cement mantle and loosening. Avoiding sharp edges is important. Uh, some of these tapered imp smooth implants compress the cement and have a good long-term record. Pre-coated and roughest, uh, roughened cemented stems have not performed as well uh, due to the, uh, the uh, preferentially, uh, preferential failure rate of the uh, cement and bone interface. The, uh, these roughened and pre-coated stems bond uh, almost too strongly to the cement mantle. Polyethylene, is, it's important to understand a number of different uh, properties of polyethylene, uh, which we'll talk about here. Uh, a couple of key concepts to remember is that uh, cross-linking improves wear. We'll talk about the manufacturing process that's involved with, uh, with uh, polyethylene. It begins with irradiation. This leads to a generation of free radicals and cross-linking. These free radicals then need to be eliminated so that uh, further oxidization does not occur. This can be done with reheating or melting. Free radical scavengers such as vitamin E have also been used. And then finally, the polyethylene needs to be sterilized before it can be used uh, in humans. This is a cartoon depiction of cross-linking of polyethylene. You can see that as a radiation is applied to the polyethylene chains, uh, uh, hydrogen radicals are formed, which leads to cross-linking of the chains. Now, there are always uh, residual free radicals that remain, and these need to be dealt with to avoid oxidation. Uh, oxidation. The polyethylene can be subsequently melted. This is a highly effective technique to remove free radicals. However, it does reduce mechanical pro properties. Annealing of the uh, polyethylene is another uh, technique that can be used. This involves heating the polyethylene to its sub-melt point. Uh, while this maintains mechanical properties, it is less effective at removing uh, free radicals.
Vitamin E is a biological antioxidant that a number of manufacturers have uh, used to uh, add to their polyethylene as well uh, to scavenge free radicals. Now this is an important slide and an important concept to, remain, uh, to, to remember. There is a trade-off to irradiation. As the dose of irradiation goes up uh, and the cross-linking goes up, while the wear resistance improves, the mechanical strength decreases. And that's a key trade-off uh, to remember when it comes to irradiation and cross-linking of polyethylene. Now the clinical outcomes uh, looking at cross-link polyethylene clearly support decreased uh, wear in vivo. A number of clinical studies have confirmed uh, superior wear characteristics of highly cross-linked poly uh, compared, to, compared to conventional polyethylene. Approximately a 90% reduction in the wear and, uh, and dramatically reduced rates of osteolysis. When it comes to polyethylene manufacturing, there are a number of different techniques that can, can be used to manufacture these implants. There are two major categories of uh, manufacturing uh, for polyethylene. Either the polyethylene is machined into the final shape or it's directly uh, molded through direct compression molding techniques. In general, direct compression molding techniques uh, seem to have a better track record. Calcium stearate, which is an industrial lubricant, uh, was added to polyethylene. This turns out to be a bad idea. Uh, gamma radiation and air is also a, a bad idea when it comes to polyethylene manufacturing. The irradiation process needs to be done in, a, in an inert environment to avoid oxidation. Let's move on to component positioning in total hip arthroplasty. Uh, it's important to know where to put the implants. On the acetabular side, we speak of the so-called safe zone. This involves uh, trying to put a cup in at about 40 degrees of abduction, the range being from 30 to 50 degrees. Uh, and in terms of antiversion, you want to aim for approximately 20 degrees, somewhere between 10 and 40 degrees. On the femoral side, we shoot for 15 degrees of antiversion. The range between 5 and 25 is generally accepted uh, in terms of getting the implant in, in the so-called safe zone. Now remember that the direction of dislocation is the direction of excess. So if a hip dislocates out the front, in all likelihood that patient has uh, excessive combined antiversion. And combined antiversion is an important uh, concept. It's not only about the cup and it's not only about the femur. It's really about the relationship of antiversion of the acetabulum to the antiversion in the femur. And our goal for the combined amount of antiversion is about 40, uh, 35 to 45 degrees as is depicted here. Now range of motion to impingement is an important concept. Uh, the uh, femoral head size and the head to neck diameter ratio uh, are important uh, concepts that we'll talk about uh, in some detail. Uh, what you need to do when putting in parts for a hip replacement is maximize that patient's range of motion until the parts begin to impinge. And typically we're talking about the femoral neck on the acetabular component. Increasing the femoral head diameter uh, and increasing the head to neck diameter ratio uh, is the most direct way to improve range of motion to impingement, assuming that the implants are put in uh, correctly. Jump distance is another important concept to understand. The larger the diameter of the femoral head, the further that femoral head has to displace before it can leave the acetabulum. And that's clearly depicted here. So the larger diameter of femoral head, the less likely or the uh, increased distance that femoral head has to travel before it exits the acetabulum. So it's, it's, uh, it's easy to understand why as we increase the femoral head diameter, uh, we increase the jump distance and we increase our stability. You can see with a 28 millimeter head, that head has about 14 millimeters it needs to travel before it dislocates. With a 38 millimeter head, of course, that jump distance goes up to 19 millimeters. Anything that decreases the range of motion to impingement can increase the risk of dislocation. I've listed a number of those things on this slide. Lipped or hooded liners, skirts or collars, constrained liners, and of course mal uh, malposition components can also decrease range of motion to impingement. It's important to understand that uh, wear refers to the progressive loss of material due to relative motion between surfaces. This can be at intended surfaces, such as between the femoral head and the acetabular polyethylene liner, or it can be at unintended surfaces. When, when hips dislocate or subluxate, we can encounter stripe wear, we can get backside wear between the polyethylene and the acetabular component, and if the femoral neck, for example, impinges on the cup, that can also lead to wear at unintended surfaces. When we talk about polyethylene particle production and osteolysis, we need to understand that adhesive wear is the, uh, is the most important uh, wear mechanism uh, that results in osteolysis. Adhesive wear occurs when bonds are formed between two surfaces, such as the femoral head and the polyethylene liner, and small amounts of material are broken over time to allow movement between those two surfaces. 
Abrasive wear occurs when there's differential hardness between surfaces or when you have third body wares or third body particles trapped between two surfaces. Uh, while this is perhaps the most intuitive uh, form of wear that we think about, this is probably less important than adhesive wear when it comes to osteolysis. Osteolysis, of course, uh, is an important concept to understand. Uh, wear particles, uh, whether that be polyethylene or metal debris, are the driving force uh, behind osteolysis. Osteolysis occurs when the macrophage uh, phagocytizes submicron polyethylene particles. Uh, and it's important to remember the macrophage is the key cell in, osteol uh, in osteolysis when we're talking about polyethylene. That's different for metal on metal hips, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. The macrophage uh, is the one that re releases the osteolytic factors that ultimately results in bone resorption by osteoclasts. So the macrophage and osteoclasts are the two key cells involved in uh, osteolysis with polyethylene. The osteolytic potential uh, uh, depends on a number of factors uh, that I've listed here, including particle volume, size, and host factors. There is a so-called osteolytic threshold of 0.1 millimeters uh, of wear per year. If you're under that amount of polyethylene wear, it's unlikely uh, that you will develop osteolysis. Now, the osteolysis uh, mediators uh, are listed on this slide. They include the uh, typical actors, TNF-alpha, uh, IL-6, et cetera. Now, osteolysis uh, looks like this on x-ray, and you should be able to recognize what osteolysis looks like. Uh, we see proximal osteopenia, as we did with stress shielding, but here we see endosteal scalloping. You can see more of this ballooning osteolytic pattern uh, as opposed to uh, just bone loss associated with stress shielding. Oftentimes, you'll see an end-bearing pedestal as well, and this can indi indicate loosening of the implant. Lubrication is important when we talk about total hip arthroplasty. Uh, there's really two major categories of uh, lubrication. Boundary lubrication, which is where the uh, asperities on each surface contact uh, directly. Uh, the opposite end of the spectrum is fluid film lubrication, where the two articulating surfaces are separated by a lubricant, in this case, synovial fluid. Uh, in reality, most hips uh, have a mixed lubrication pattern uh, where there is some separation of the surfaces, just enough to prevent severe wear, but the asperities do, in, in fact, come into contact. One of the proposed benefits of large head metal on metal total hips uh, was that we could achieve this fluid film lubrication uh, regime and reduce wear. So let's talk a little bit about metal on metal total hips. I think that this is uh, a uh, commonly tested item at this point in time and has a good chance of showing up on your test. There, have been a number of, there were a number of proposed theoretical benefits to metal on metal total hips, reduced wear, increased stability, uh, un, uh, inability to fracture, and this in, improved lubrication uh, uh, regimes were all proposed theoretical benefits. The contraindications uh, when we started putting in metal on metal hips included fe uh, females of childbearing age as the ions do cross the placenta, as well as renal failure. Now, we, we saw early on uh, some of this data, some of these hip simulator uh, data studies showing the potential for dramatically reduced uh, wear with metal and metal hips, particularly large diameter metal and metal hips. But this did not uh, pan out. We saw a, an increased early revision rate with uh, metal and metal hips, uh, and the reason for this is, is likely multifactorial. But there's no question that the in vivo wear rates were orders of magnitude higher than what we thought they would be based on the in vitro wear data from the hip simulators. And I've depicted here a couple of studies uh, showing that the clinical wear was substantially higher than what we predicted with the uh, hip simulator studies. There are a number of design features we've learned that are important to metal on metal total hip arthroplasties. One is this idea of clearance. It's important to get the clearance just right. If you have too little clearance, the head can seize on the cup. If you have too much clearance, you end up getting polar contact. Both of these are, uh, are uh, not advantageous and can lead to trouble. We also learned a lot about this functional articular arc and keeping the wear within the constraints of the cup. Edge wear occurs when the maximum area of wear crosses over the edge of the cup. This leads to a large increase in local contact pressures, increased wear, and breakdown of lubrication. When we look at retrievals, uh, as is depicted on the right of this slide, we see that a number of failed hip replacements with high wear rates showed clear evidence of edge wear. Edge wear can occur when, when the hip impinges. It can occur with micro-separation uh, during ambulation and other activities and can occur with edge loading. Edge loading, again, occurs when the, uh, the contact area, the wear area, is outside the limits or the edge of the cup. This may be due to reduced coverage of the cup. A lot of these metal-on-metal -metal cups were less than a hemisphere. Steep inclination or a vertical position of the cup can also lead to edge wear, and finally, reduced clearance. 
Metal on metal failure rates have clearly been device dependent. Uh, we know that cup position is important, that vertical cups were associated with increased uh, failure rates, uh, potentially due to the edge wear issues, as I just uh, mentioned. When it came to hip resurfacing with metal on metal implants, we found higher failure rates with smaller implants, typically female patients. The opposite was true with total hip arthroplasty, where we found that the larger implants actually had a higher failure rate. And this may be due to, to wear issues with the trunnion and corrosion, which we'll touch on uh, later. So the clinical outcomes of metal on metal, clearly higher rates of revision. Multiple registry studies have uh, confirmed that at this point. You need to understand a little bit about the local soft tissue reactions, the pseudotumors that have been reported with metal on metal uh, uh, bearings, as well as with the corrosion problems. Uh, the adverse local tissue reaction seems to be uh, an allergic type response in some and in others it can be a direct uh, toxicity uh, uh, problem. ALVAL uh, is a uh, histological diagnosis. It stands for aseptic lymphocytic vasculitis associated lesions. Uh, this is a lymphocytic uh, process uh, which is similar uh, in, uh, to delayed hypersensitivity reactions. It seems to be more common in females and small components, although I think that's not quite, uh, quite clear at this point. Uh, often in aspirating these patients we'll get no cells, it's all degenerative material, uh, and a manual cell count is important when working up these patients. If you get a question on the test involving a metal on metal hip and you see a histological slide like this with a number of, of uh, lymphocytes, it's likely that the uh, question is leading you down the path of an adverse local tissue reaction or alval response to a metal on metal hip or a, um, or a trunnion problem. This is what the MRI looks like in a patient with a uh, adverse local soft tissue reaction. We can see a number of cystic masses, sometimes solid masses around uh, the total hip arthroplasty. Again, if you see an MRI with a metal on metal hip, they're likely trying to lead you down this path. This is what it looks like clinically. We see widespread necrosis, uh, and what we're all afraid of in these patients is loss of the abductors, as that's a very difficult uh, problem to solve. Hip resurfacing, the good of hip resurfacing is that it preserves the femoral bone stock. The bad is the unique complication of femoral neck fracture, um, and uh, <clears throat> this, this was seen at about 1%. The uh, enthusiasm for hip resurfacing has certainly decreased over the last several years due to some of these metal-on-metal uh, -metal, uh, bearing problems. When working up the painful metal-on-metal -metal hip, uh, there's a couple of important points uh, to remember. Number one is do not forget the standard evaluation of all painful total hip arthroplasties. Just because a patient has a metal on metal hip does not mean that their failure is due to that metal on metal bearing. So the typical causes for failure, such as infection, should always be investigated in these patients. When it comes to serum metal ion levels, we know that they're not diagnostic. Normal is somewhere less than one part per billion. When they get above seven to 10 parts per billion, we start to get worried. But we know that, they, that metal ion levels cannot be used in isolation to diagnose a problem with a metal on metal hip. We've seen some patients with severe local soft tissue reactions with very low metal ion levels and vice versa. The MARS MRI or the Metal Suppression Protocol MRI is the imaging modality of choice for evaluating a patient with a, uh, with a metal on metal hip arthroplasty. And I would say that in 2016, uh, I would be very careful about observing a metal on metal hip uh, unless the patient is completely asymptomatic and an adverse local soft tissue reaction has been uh, excluded with labs in an MRI. The indications for metal on metal hip revision uh, at this point are somewhat variable, uh, although I'll tell you that high risk patients include any patient who's symptomatic, any patient who has mechanical symptoms. Certainly, a change in gait or abductor weakness is very concerning. Uh, a suboptimal cup position with a vertical cup is always uh, concerning as well. High ion levels, over 10 parts per billion, and, a, and an abnormal MRI. I think any one of those things uh, should uh, prompt consideration of revision surgery. When it comes to revising a patient with a metal on metal hip, uh, it's important to remove all recalled implants. Uh, any necrotic soft tissue should be debrided. Uh, we do know that revision of metal on metal hips, unfortunately, is associated with a high rate of complications, such as dislocation, failed bony ingrowth, uh, and infection. Taper corrosion and trunnionosis has received a lot of attention over the past few years. It's important to understand uh, the concerns about uh, the corrosion that can occur at the taper uh, modular head junction. This appears to be a mechanically assisted chemical corrosive process. It may be related to head size and femoral offset. Uh, cobalt tends to be elevated more than chromium. The end result of this can be an alval type pathology, similar to metal on metal total hip arthroplasty, with pseudotumors and local uh, tissue necrosis uh, reported. This may also be seen in metal on polyethylene total hips, so this is not uh, isolated to uh, a certain particular bearing type. 
Uh, there has been a move away from metal hips towards ceramic hips uh, in the past few years to try to alleviate some of these concerns. Corrosion is the gradual destruction of metal by reaction with the environment. Uh, there are a number of different types of corrosion. Fretting corrosion occurs uh, when there's small cyclic motion between two, sur uh, two surfaces. This can occur at any modular junction. Uh, when we talk about total hip arthroplasty and trunnionosis, of course, we're, about, we're concerned with the femoral head and the femoral uh, neck junction. This can lead to disruption in the protective oxide layer. Anytime the oxide layer uh, is disrupted, this can lead to further corrosion. Crevice corrosion occurs uh, when a crevice is created. This creates local conditions that uh, can dramatically increase the rate of oxidation. Galvanic corrosion is the one that we think about with batteries. This occurs when two different metals are involved. Ceramic on ceramic total hips have a number of advantages. This is the lowest wear bearing couple that we have. The wear debris tends to be inert and, and non-toxic. The disadvantages include fracture risk and squeaking. Uh, with modern ceramic on ceramic bearings, there is a very low incidence of noise and fracture, but it does remain a concern. Uh, some of the older zirconia heads had uh, phase transformation concerns uh, that uh, limited their uh, long-term survivorship. Despite these disadvantages, I think there's uh, limited enthusiasm for ceramic on ceramic in North America, uh, one reason being cost. Uh, ceramic or metal on polyethylene total hips, uh, <coughs> the, there is a theoretical wear benefit to a ceramic head on a polyethylene liner, although the clinical studies have not clearly shown an advantage uh, to poly or to uh, ceramic on poly versus metal on uh, poly. As I mentioned earlier, some of the concerns about corrosion with metal femoral heads uh, have le uh, led to some surgeons going away from metal heads to, uh, to ceramic heads to alleviate some of these concerns. Hemiarthroplasty in 2016, I think, is really relegated to the treatment of displaced femoral neck fractures in the elderly. The advantage here is stability. Retaining the labrum in the capsule, uh, repairing the capsule at the end uh, may help with uh, stability. Some of the disadvantages include uh, increased groin pain, protrusio, and worse function over time. Uh, this is why with uh, patients, younger patients in particular, who are active, uh, we're doing more and more total hips uh, for femoral neck fracture than we used to in the past. I think there's no good data to support using a bipolar head over a unipolar head. Uh, and younger patients, as I mentioned, uh, or more active patients who have failed open reduction internal fixation of femoral neck fracture should be treated with total hip arthroplasty. Let's move on to some of the complications uh, we see after total hip arthroplasty, uh, specifically periprosthetic fractures and infection. Neurologic complications are a common topic uh, that are tested uh, on, uh, on exams. The incidence of neurologic complication in total hip arthroplasty is about 1%. These are predominantly sciatic nerve uh, injuries. The sciatic nerve comes closest to the acetabulum at the level of the ischium, and the perineal division is most commonly injured. Uh, there's a number of reasons why. Uh, you want to know what a perineal nerve injury can lead to, uh, namely foot drop, uh, as this is a common way that this concept is tested. If you have a patient who had a total hip arthroplasty who had uh, intact EHL function and they lose it on the night after surgery, that's an emergency. That patient needs to be taken back to the operating room. It's likely due to a hematoma that needs to be evacuated immediately. 50% of neurologic complications uh, resolve. Hip extension and knee flexion decreases tension on the nerve. It's important to understand why that's the case. The converse is true as well, of course. Uh, if you have a patient who has uh, sciatic nerve uh, palsy, you want to decrease tension on the nerve. There are some specific considerations uh, regarding complications after total hip arthroplasty. I've listed a number of associations on this slide that you want to be familiar with, uh, and we'll walk through these. With sickle cell patients, we're concerned about early loosening. With psoriatic arthritis, infection. Ankylosing spondylitis, the concern is stiffness and heterotopic ossifications. Parkinson's patients have a particularly high rate of dislocation and mortality reported in the literature. Dialysis patients are probably the highest risk patients for infection after total hip arthroplasty. And I think that's, a, that's somewhat obvious when you think about the uh, recurrent, um, when you think about the recurrent uh, venipuncture and uh, potential for bacteremia that these patients uh, face, it's no wonder that the infection rate is uh, very high. Loosening is also a concern in dialysis patients uh, due to uh, bone quality. As I mentioned earlier, those patients that have been irradiated uh, should probably be treated with cementless implants due to concern for lack of uh, potential for bone ingrowth, although some of the highly porous metals have shown promise in patients who have been irradiated. Heterotopic ossification is more common in males. It has been associated with a direct uh, lateral approach and potentially an anterior approach as well. You should understand prophylaxis for HO uh, in patients undergoing total hip arthroplasty. 
It can be done with uh, radiation. It's low-dose radiation, 700 rads, either within 24 hours prior to surgery or within the 48 hours after the operation. Uh, Indocin or other NSAIDs have also been used uh, as a way to prophylax uh, against heterotopic ossification. The literature has variable dosing uh, methods. Uh, in general, you want to continue uh, Indocin or other similar NSAID for one to six weeks after surgery. What you need to keep in mind is that there is no role for late radiation or medications. If a patient returns to clinic at two weeks or six weeks and they have heterotopic ossification forming, you don't want to irradiate them at that point or treat them with NSAIDs. At that point, you need to let the uh, heterotopic run, uh, ossification process run its course. For those patients who have mature heterotopic ossification, if they have pain or limited range of motion, then you can consider surgical excision. The Brooker classification is commonly used with heterotopic ossification. I don't think it's necessarily important that you, uh, that you memorize the particulars of this classification, but you should understand that grade four means severe uh, ossification to the point of ankylosis, and grade one is the more minor, minor, uh, mild heterotopic ossification that we may see that really does not uh, limit range of motion uh, or cause other problems. Limb length discrepancy, uh, lengthening, slight lengthening of the operative limb is fairly common after total hip arthroplasty. Most patients rarely notice this if, uh, or have, or there's any impact on function if it's less than a centimeter. Once we get above two centimeters of lengthening, we start getting concerned with, uh, with uh, nerve issues. Remember that patients may perceive a limb length discrepancy after total hip arthroplasty due to soft tissue differences or weak abductors, uh, the so-called perceived limb length uh, uh, discrepancy that will resolve with time. Templating reduces the incidence of limb length discrepancy, and you should understand how to uh, template a total hip arthroplasty. This is a patient with a perceived limb length discrepancy. Understand how to measure leg lengths uh, with total hip arthroplasty, as you can see, uh, as was done here on the right. You can see that this patient did not have a significant uh, change in their limb length after their hip replacement was performed. Iliopsoas tendonitis is a cause of groin pain after total hip arthroplasty. This is typically seen in patients uh, who have uh, groin pain with resisted hip flexion on examination. Make sure to exclude other causes for pain, including infection. What, what you may see on radiographic imaging is prominence of the anterior edge of the cup, as is depicted on this x-ray. An image-guided injection into the iliopsoas tendon sheath can be helpful to establish the diagnosis. Uh, occasionally, it can be helpful in terms of uh, treating the patient as well. If a patient has recurrent uh, or uh, problematic iliopsoas tendonitis, uh, then the treatment involves revising the cup if it's prominent or, or lengthening the iliopsoas through a tenotomy if there is no anterior cup overhang. So if the cup is potentially uh, contributing to the iliopsoas tendonitis by being prominent anteriorly, it should be revised. Polyethylene wear and osteolysis, this is a common uh, test on, or a common topic uh, t that's often tested on these examinations. Uh, what I'll tell you is that you should always look at the radiograph and recognize eccentric positioning of the femoral head. As you can see in this case, the femoral head is not sitting in the middle of that cup, and that's due to polyethylene wear. If you get an x-ray that looks like this on the test, in all likelihood, the test writer is leading you down the road of polyethylene wear and osteolysis. When it comes to treatment of polyethylene wear, uh, I've uh, put a few uh, pointers up on this slide. Number one, if the patient is symptomatic or has a massive lytic defect, uh, then that patient in all likelihood uh, needs to be, revision, uh, to be revised. The most important part of revision for polyethylene wear is addressing the polyethylene uh, uh, particle generator, revising the polyethylene. If you have a well-positioned and well-fixed metal cup, then a polyethylene exchange is an acceptable treatment option. If the metal cup is damaged or is loose, or is poorly positioned, then you want to revise the cup as well. The most common postoperative complication after revision for polyethylene wear is instability, and using a larger femoral head is advised uh, or is advisable in these patients. Bone grafting is controversial. If it's an option, I would choose it on the test. Uh, I think it's unclear as to how much of the bone graft actually incorporates and whether it's absolutely mandatory. I've listed the incidence of total hip arthroplasty dislocation uh, on this slide. There is some data suggesting the incidence is incre increasing. Uh, we know that the highest incidence of uh, dislocation is in post-traumatic patients uh, with very high rates of dislocation reported in the literature. When we think about dislocation of total hip arthroplasty, we need to think about patient factors, surgeon factors, as well as implant factors, and we'll walk through these. When it comes to patient risk factors, we know that females have a higher risk of dislocation. Certainly, uh, patients with neuromuscular problems like Parkinson's disease are very high risk for uh, instability. Alcohol use has been uh, associated with dislocation, 
and then any prior hip surgery as well also increases the risk. Treatment of dislocation, the initial dislocation is uh, treated with closed reduction. A brace is somewhat controversial. A neomobilizer can prevent a knee flexion, and in the case of a posterior hip dislocation can be beneficial, uh, and I think bracing is a reasonable option. For the early dislocator, that is the patient who's dislocated within the first six weeks of surgery, two-thirds of those patients will not dislocate again. Once a patient is dislocated three times, it's much like uh, baseball, three strikes and you're out. This is when we start talking about the, uh, with the patient about revision surgery. I've presented here an algorithm for how to uh, identify problems with the unstable hip and how to treat the, uh, the uh, dislocated hip. It really comes down to identifying the problem and fixing that problem. The first question you want to ask yourself is, are the components malpositioned? If the components are malpositioned, then it's a very straightforward answer. Those components need to be revised and repositioned into an optimum place. If there, are no, if there is no component malposition, then you want to identify any potential uh, causes of impingement, whether this be osteophytes uh, or lipped liners, skirted liners, etc. If you can fix these things, then those things should be fixed. Upsizing the femoral head, increasing the jump distance, improving the head-neck ratio, all of these can be helpful in uh, improving the stability of the hip. If you have no component malposition and no sign of impingement, then this is likely a soft tissue problem, specifically an abductor deficient hip, and this is probably the one indication on the test for a constrained liner. You should be able to assess malposition on x-ray. You can see this is a retroverted cup. The image on the right is a lateral of the hip. You can see how that cup is, is, uh, is neutral to retroverted, uh, and that, that should be easy to identify if given that x-ray. Conversely, here we see the excessively anaverted cup. On the lateral x-ray, you can see that that cup opens anteriorly. Uh, that cup is likely to dislocate out the front. You should be able to recognize those things on x-ray. The treatment for instability, again, comes down to identifying uh, potential causes that can be corrected. If the components are malpositioned and there's impingement, correct those problems. If it's a soft tissue problem, increasing the abductor tension can be done through trochanteric advancement, increasing leg length, increasing offset, and then finally using a constrained liner if the abductors are truly deficient. Remember that increasing head size and increasing head neck ratio uh, is also important in improving uh, hip stability. If you have a position who has well positioned implants, I think it's reasonable to upsize the femoral head as we've mentioned, uh, particularly in cases like this where there is a, already a large revision cup. Improving the head size relative to the cup can be helpful in maintaining stability. Constrained liners come in a variety of different flavors. You can see a few of these depicted here. The fundamental concept is that all of them hold onto the femoral head to try to prevent dislocation. They all reduce the range of motion to impingement, uh, which is why these should not be used in malpositioned, uh, malpositioned, with malpositioned implants. They have been associated with high failure rates, and again, reserve this for uh, patients that have true abductor insufficiency. Dual mobility femoral heads have received increasing uh, attention and popularity in the past few years. This essentially involves placing a bipolar femoral head into an acetabular cup, which is essentially an unconstrained tripolar articulation. This does introduce increased numbers of articulations, which is always a concern. There's also the concern for intraprosthetic dislocation, where the inner femoral head dislocates from the outer femoral head. The benefits of this, uh, this construct include increased head-neck ratio, uh, increased femoral head diameter, and improved jump distance. Moving on to aseptic loosening. Aseptic loosening remains the number one cause of long-term revision of uh, total hip arthroplasty. As mentioned earlier, the cemented cup uh, tends to fail at a higher rate than the cementless implant. Uh, with uncemented uh, implants, look for femoral osteolysis. Serial radiographs can be very helpful in terms of looking for loose implants, uh, both clinically as well as on your test. You should know that the typical symptoms of a loose implant are, are startup pain, the so-called pain with few, uh, the first few steps that tends to improve. If you have a patient who has startup pain in the groin, that typically is a cup problem. Startup pain in the thigh, the test uh, writer is taking you down the path of a loose stem. The radiographic uh, hallmarks of loosening should be familiar to you. Uh, with the cementless stem, you're looking for subsidence, as you can see on this uh, x-ray here. You can see where that stem started relative to the calcar and when, where it ended up. A pedestal also uh, on your test is likely to be representative of a, of a loose implant. You can see why serial radiographs are particularly helpful. When we look at a cemented stem, progressive radiolucencies, migration of the stem, and fracture of the cement mantle are all hall hallmarks of a loose cemented implant. On the revision side, when we're dealing with uh, femoral bone loss, 
the Paprosky classification is commonly used to identify the severity of bone loss. I've listed that classification on this slide. Type 1 involves an intact metaphysis. This is like a primary total hip. Most femoral components, primary or revision, are going to be successful in a type 1 femur. This is encountered uh, uncommonly in revision work. The type 2 uh, femur involves metaphyseal bone loss. Uh, this is typically where we're bypassing the damaged metaphysis and obtaining our fixation distally uh, in the diaphysis. A type 3 defect includes some diaphyseal damage as well. A 3A uh, refers to the femur that still has 4 centimeters or more of diaphysis remaining. A 3B occurs when both the metaphysis and a significant portion of the diaphysis are damaged to the point where there's less than four centimeters of diaphysis remaining for fixation. The type four femur, those are the severe femurs that involve a non-supportive diaphysis. Um, my uh, tip for you in terms of the revision femur is that if you're in doubt about what implant to choose, choose a, choose a cementless diaphyseal engaging stem, assuming there is diaphysis left, of course. As I mentioned earlier, in the type one femur, which is relatively uncommon, a primary total hip arthroplasty implant will work. For twos and threes, again, it's a cementless diaphyseal engaging stem. For type fours, where the diaphysis is non-supportive, then we're getting into the allograft prosthetic composite or a tumor prosthesis uh, uh, implant. There are two uh, very common stems that are used in revision femoral work. One is the extensively coated cylindrical stem. This has become less popular recently. It's a little bit more difficult to use. Uh, you do need four centimeters of isthmus required for fixation. These tend to be uh, stiff cobalt chrome implants. The tapered fluted modular stem has increased in popularity in the past 10 years. This is a titanium implant. It's a little bit more flexible than the, uh, than the fully porous coated cobalt chrome implants. Uh, two centimeters of isthmus is probably required. Occasionally we can get away with uh, even less than that. And the nice thing about these modular implants is that version and leg length can be, uh, can be uh, put together independent of the distal fixation. So the distal stem obtains fixation. The proximal body allows variation in limb length uh, offset and anaversion, which can be very helpful in terms of restoring biomechanics. Moving on to the acetabular side, uh, acetabular bone defect defects come in two flavors, the cavitary bone defect. These are the small defects that are relatively easy to deal with, with uh, allograft or autograft. The segmental defects are the ones that can impair the ability to obtain a stable cup. These are the ones that become uh, challenging. If you have two-thirds of the rim intact in the revision acetabulum, a cementless uh, porous coated hemispherical cup uh, is perfectly appro appropriate. 50% of acetabular bone stock is typically required for this type of implant. This will be the majority of revision cases that the surgeon is likely to encounter. When we get into more significant segmental bone loss, then we need to start thinking about something else, especially if we have pelvic discontinuity. That's where we start getting into things like cup cages, custom cups, and allograft. A jumbo cup is typically defined as being greater than 62 millimeters of, in diameter in women and 66 millimeters in men. A couple things to remember with jumbo cups uh, is that they have been associated with an increased dislocation rate. That probably should be no surprise. These patients have often had many operations. Uh, they have uh, deficits in their soft tissues. There can be a significant amount of dead space around the implant uh, and you want to really maximize the femoral head to cup size ratio. So try to use the largest femoral you, uh, head you can uh, in these patients. Identifying patients who need something more than a hemispherical cup is important. Uh, if you see something like this, where you have massive bone loss and pelvic discontinuity, then you do not want to check the box that says hemispherical cup. This is where you need to do something else. Now, whether it's a cup cage, whether it's a plate, whether it's a custom triflange component, whether it's allograft, I think it's unlikely that the test takers will ask you to choose between those options. It's controversial. We don't necessarily know what the right answer is. But what they do want you to know is be able to identify the cases where you need something beyond just a hemispherical cup. I've depicted a number of different options on this slide. Uh, and again, I think choosing between these is going to be beyond the scope of, of the test. You should know about screw placement in the revision acetabulum. Uh, the danger zone is the anterior superior zone. Uh, this is the so-called zone of death, where getting a screw into the external iliac artery and vein uh, can uh, quickly uh, lead to the patient expiring. This is an uh, emergency, of course, so you want to keep your screws uh, out of the uh, anterior zone if possible and be very careful in placing screws if you do end up using this uh, zone. Again, it's the anterior superior zone is the zone of death. The anterior inferior zone uh, puts the obturator artery at risk. This can lead to significant bleeding, uh, but this is rarely uh, life-threatening. 
Periprosthetic fractures, this is a commonly tested topic. Uh, the Vancouver classification is the classification most commonly used uh, when we're talking about periprosthetic fractures. A Vancouver A involves a fracture of the greater or lesser trochanter. A Vancouver B is a fracture around the implant, and these are the ones that are most likely to be tested. C-type fractures are distal to the implant and can be dealt with using standard techniques. If you have a type A fracture of the greater or lesser trochanter, these are typically treated non-operatively with the exception of the displaced gr greater trochanter. These are the ones that we uh, treat with open reduction internal fixation. Again, a type C, which is a fracture well distal to the hip, those we treat as you would any other fracture. When we talk about the type B fractures in the middle of this slide, the B1, B2, and B3, these are the ones where you're likely to be, uh, you're likely to be tested on. And this is how I would recommend that you deal with these fractures. Number one, ask yourself, is the implant loose or not? And the question will often lead you down the path. They will tell you if the patient had pain, startup pain in the thigh, et cetera. If the patient has a loose stem, then you need to revise that loose implant. You can't leave a loose implant. So that patient needs cementless distal fixation. If the stem is well fixed, then that patient should be treated with open reduction internal fixation. And then if you're revising the femur, you need to decide what the bone quality is, life, is, is like. If you have adequate diaphysis to obtain cementless fixation, then that should be your answer. If the diaphysis is inadequate for diaphyseal engagement, then that's where you need to use either heavy metal, a tumor prosthesis, or an allograft prosthetic composite. Remember that you don't need to revise well-positioned implants. If you have a cup that's in good position, you can leave that cup alone. This is a typical Vancouver B1 fracture. You can see a stable stem that was fixed with a plate and screws. Proximally, you want to use a combination of locking screws and, and uh, cerclage wires or cables. In a Vancouver B2, this is a stem that's loose. This, again, requires revision of the stem uh, to, a, uh, to achieve stable fixation. Let's talk a little bit about the intraoperative calcar fracture. This is a common uh, tested uh, uh, topic. If you have a small calcar crack, there's a number of things you want to do in surgery. Number one is remove the stem. Number two is make sure that fracture does not propagate past the calcar, past the lesser trochanter. Number three, cerclage cable or wire the femur proximally, as was done in this situation. Number four, reinsert the same stem. Uh, and uh, finally, making sure that stem is stable. If that stem is not stable, then you need to use an implant uh, that is stable. Now, if you put in a stem that's not stable, this can uh, be the result. You can get an acute postoperative periprosthetic fracture. You can see subsidence of the stem. The stem is obviously loose. This needs stem revision to a cementless uh, diaphyseal engaging implant. Let's talk briefly about periprosthetic fracture. Uh, this is a big deal in arthroplasty. We've identified a number of risk factors, patient risk factors for infection, including those listed here. Uh, obesity, diabetes, uh, et cetera, have all been linked with periprosthetic uh, hip infection. Staphylococcus is the most common uh, culprit in these infections. In the acute postoperative infection, think Staph aureus. If it's a more chronic infection, a longstanding infection, you want to think coag negative st uh, staph. Strep is another common organism, but really anything you can think of can be implicated in periprosthetic fracture. One of the big challenges is biofilm on the implant. We know that this forms within four weeks, uh, sometimes even less. Uh, and this can protect bacteria from the immune system as well as antibiotic treatment. This is why, for established periprosthetic infections, we often have to remove the implants to fully treat the infection. There are several different types of prosthetic joint infection. I've listed those here. You're likely on your test to encounter the uh, either uh, type 2 and 4, which is the early postoperative infection within the first month, or the acute hematogenous infection in a well-functioning hip, uh, or number three, which is the late chronic uh, periprosthetic infection. You should be familiar with the MSIS criteria for periprosthetic infection. I've listed that here. We won't go into it for the sake of time, uh, but you should familiarize yourself with this uh, definition. It's important to know what the aspiration cutoffs are for defining infection. In the acute postoperative infection, we're looking for a white blood cell count greater than 10,000 and a differential above 90%. In the chronic infection, the white blood cell cutoff is around 2,000 cells with a differential of 60%. Now, there's a gray zone here, and I would recommend that, uh, that you just recognize a very high number and a very low number. The test writers are unlikely to ask you to differentiate between subtle deviations from these cutoffs. With the acute postoperative infection, you want to avoid uh, starting antibiotics. Uh, drawing labs uh, and taking the patient for an ID, IND is important if the wound is draining. You don't want to bury your head in the sand on these, uh, with these patients. Taking the patient back to the operating room uh, if you've decided to retain implants uh, is critical. 
CRP should go down over time if you're concerned about a patient and whether or not they have an infection uh, and the CRP remains elevated, uh, this can be very concerning for a persistent infection. So how well does irrigation and debridement and implant retention work? Well, it depends on a number of factors. The bottom line is that uh, some of the recent data has suggested that this is only successful in about 30 to 40 percent of the time. With chronic infection, <coughs> we're typically uh, going to proceed with a two-stage revision. Two-stage revision remains the gold standard for chronic infection in total hip arthroplasty. How do we do this? Well, <coughs> we remove the implants, we place a spacer, we treat patients with six weeks of intravenous antibiotics, and then return when the infection is gone to re-implant the hip. Single-stage revision for infection, uh, for chronic infection, is really the European standard. They do it uh, more frequently than we do. I think there's some move to this in the United States, uh, but at the moment a two-stage revision remains uh, the gold standard. When it comes to spacers, whether it be in the hip or the knee, um, <clears throat> there's very little difference between a static or a mobile spacer. Uh, there is some data to suggest uh, ease of re-implantation in, uh, in mobile spacers, in articulating spacers, but no difference in terms of outcomes, particularly infection eradication. When using antibiotics in cement, you want to keep the amount of antibiotics low if you're using it for a re-implant, less than one gram, per, or one gram or less per batch uh, of cement. If you get above that level, then we start getting into trouble with mechanical properties. So is there a role for antibiotic suppression? I think there's limited circumstances to try this clinically, and for the purposes of the test, I would stay away from uh, antibiotic suppression for periprosthetic joint infection. When it comes to VTE and total hip arthroplasty, uh, I think uh, there's a couple of things you want to keep in mind. You want to be familiar with patient risk factors, which I've listed here. Uh, remember that most clinical VTE events occur between the, se the second and sixth week after surgery, and pulmonary events on the day of surgery are typically cardiac or fat embolism and less likely to be VTE. You should familiar uh, familiarize yourself with the Academy's guidelines for DVT prophylaxis. I've listed a couple of the key points uh, on this slide. Uh, similarly, some of the DVT prophylaxis pearls are listed on this slide. Recognize the mechanism of, of action of a number of these different medications. We won't go through all of these, but I think referring to this list uh, before your test can be very helpful uh, as this is a commonly tested topic. We try to stay away from transfusion after arthroplasty. We know that transfusion increases the risk for periprosthetic joint infection. A few things that have been shown to be beneficial include hypotensive uh, epidural or spinal anesthesia, tranexamic acid, uh, both of those can be helpful. There's really no benefit to preoperative autologous donation for non-anemic patient, uh, patients. There have been a number of studies that have uh, suggested this to be the case. Similarly, bipolar celiar electrocautery has not been shown to be a benefit in a number of randomized studies. Tranexamic acid has really become popular in the past few years. This is an anti-fibrinolytic agent that inhibits plasminogen. Uh, it's contraindicated in patients with uh, active VTE or renal failure. Uh, and there's, there's no evidence in the literature that it increases the risk of VTE. A couple of young adult hip pathologies that I want to touch on here as we wrap up. Number one is osteonecrosis. Osteonecrosis is a blood flow problem. You should be able to recognize osteonecrosis on an x-ray and MRI. There are some associations uh, with osteonecrosis in alcohol, steroids, trauma, and sickle cell disease. And of course, the medial femoral circumflex artery uh, is the main blood flow to the uh, adult femoral head. There are a number of different classifications of AVN in the literature. What they all have in common is that when you get to stage three disease, you're involving either articular surface collapse or imminent articular surface collapse through the crescent sign. So if you have a patient that has stage three disease or worse, that patient gets a total hip arthroplasty. You should not uh, check the box for any hip preservation option uh, for a patient that has stage three disease or, or more. So hip preservation should really be reserved for those patients who have pre-collapsed disease, as you can see here. Whether it's a free vascularized fibular graft or core decompression is controversial, and it's unlikely that they would ask you that on the test. When we talk about young adult hip pathology, uh, we, uh, the major uh, categories here are femoral tabular impingement and the dysplasia of the hip. Uh, these are important uh, from the adult reconstruction side because the majority of patients in North America probably have some degree of underlying impingement or DDH. And remember that these are two ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have the, uh, the FAI hip, which is overconstrained, that impinges. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the unstable hip or the dysplastic hip. Now, femoroacetabular impingement is uh, covered in the sports lecture. I won't get into the treatment options, the hip preser preserving treatment options for FAI. 
as these are covered elsewhere. When it comes to total hip arthroplasty, uh, this is really an, an option for patients who have advanced FAI with associated arthritis, certainly patients 50 years or above, uh, really uh, total hip arthroplasty should be the treatment of choice. Talking about hip dysplasia, there are a number of anatomic uh, considerations for the dysplastic hip. Uh, when we look at the acetabulum, I've listed a number of those uh, anatomic variations on this slide. If you're going to remember one thing about the acetabulum, remember that it is excessively antiverted. Same thing on the femur. Uh, remember that there is increased neck antiversion of the dysplastic uh, femur. There are a number of other changes as well, uh, uh, as with the acetabulum that I've listed here. The problem with the hip dysplasia is that you have a reduced contact area. Uh, between the femoral head and the acetabulum. This leads to increased contact stresses and as a result ultimately uh, arthritis. Femoral head coverage uh, radiographically is identified with a number of different um, uh, measures. The most common one is the lateral center edge angle or the uh, or Weiberg angle as I've depicted here. Normal is about 25 to 30 degrees. You can see how this is drawn with a vertical line down to the center of the femoral head uh, and a second line that, uh, that uh, goes from the center of the femoral head out to the lateral edge of the acetabulum. And again, if you have less than 25 or 30 degrees, you have an uncovered femoral head and likely a dysplastic hip. You should recognize that uh, the uh, anterior insufficiency is a concern as well. So this hip is not only shallow, but excessively anverted. You can see here we've depicted the center edge angle of Weiberg as well. It's important to recognize these uh, features on x-ray. The tonus or surseal angle is also a, a commonly tested angle in the, the dysplastic hip. You can see how that's uh, depicted here. Uh, when you have uh, less than 10 degrees, uh, you typically have a typical hip above 10 degrees, or uh, once you get abnormal, you have a very vertical roof of the acetabulum, which is, uh, which is associated with dysplasia. A few treatment considerations for the dysplastic hip. Number one is arthroscopy is rarely the correct answer. Be careful choosing that uh, in any patient who has uh, substantial dysplasia. Remember that you want to address all pathology. Most patients with dysplasia have both femoral and acetabular sided pathology that needs to be addressed. On the acetabular side, the periacetabular osteotomy is going to be your treatment of choice. Any anytime you have the option to repair the labrum, do that. You do not want to de uh, debride the labrum if given the option. And then just like with FAI, if you have a patient who has substantial uh, destruction of the joint with arthritis or joint space narrowing, then total hip arthroplasty is going to be the treatment of choice. When it comes to the periacetabular osteotomy, there are a number of advantages to these, this osteotomy, which is why it has become very popular. It allows for a high degree of correction uh, uh, while maintaining the integrity of the posterior uh, column. You can see that depicted here. Uh, the osteotomy, again, does not involve the posterior column and allows a, a significant amount of correction of the uh, acetabular version and inclination. When it comes to hip dysplasia and total hip arthroplasty, the Crow classification is the most commonly used classification. Again, it's a little bit complicated. I wouldn't uh, recommend that you necessarily uh, uh, memorize the classification, but you should recognize that a Crow 4 hip is the high dislocation. That's the patient whose femoral head is no longer uh, in the same zip code as the acetabulum. That's the, uh, the, the depiction here, as you can see uh, in this, in this uh, cartoon. In those cases, when it comes to total hip arthroplasty, uh, we worry about uh, uh, lengthening of the leg. The concern with lengthening of the leg, of course, is the nerve. If you stretch uh, the nerve, it can stop working. Lengthening the sciatic nerve more than two to four centimeters, or approximately 10% of the total length of the nerve, has been associated with a sciatic nerve palsy. The way we treat this or get around this concern with total hip arthroplasty is to perform a subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy. So again, the patient with a Crow 4 high dislocation needs a subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy of the femur uh, at the time of total hip arthroplasty to avoid excessive lengthening and nerve concerns. On the acetabular side and hip dysplasia, it can be a challenge to find uh, adequate bone uh, to anchor the cup. Uh, high hip centers, uh, we generally try to avoid. We try to put the cup down in the anatomic position. Uh, sometimes using a protrusio technique can be helpful where we medialize the cup uh, to uh, achieve enough coverage. Uh, bone grafting of the shallow socket is also a possibility. Typically, this is done uh, with the patient's own femoral head. 